welcome to today's episode of CLCI Live, brought to you by the award-winning and ICF-accredited school, Certified Life Coach Institute. Sit back, relax, and enjoy today's episode. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another CLCI Live here at 4. We're excited to have you guys join us once again. Um, we did put out some information saying that we'd be speaking about relationship killers this week, but actually... That information is not correct. We're going to be speaking about couples coaching next week is when we'll visit um, relationship killers. So we're excited for that, but we're even more excited just because this is, you know, we're in the moment at, as we speak about uh, couples coaching today. And we have Lisa here, a couples coach of our own, and she can go ahead and kind of explain to you a little bit what couples coaching is. And then Lisa, if you can, just your experience um, around couples coaching and anything that you might be able to say about it. So I would explain about how I got drawn into couples coaching. It really wasn't something I out and out chose. I had people in my sphere of life that kept trying to get me to uh, help their relationship. And I just kept going, no, no. And then I took this, you know, coaching class way back when 2011, I think back then prior to that, I'd worked with individuals about relationships. So kind of all the way back to my twenties on, I'm only 22 now, just kidding. <laughs> all the way through time, always about relationships. And then that step towards couples was somebody's suggestion that I should really try that out. And uh, the idea was, and there's no way on this earth do I want to do that. And they kept talking. And so I said, okay, let me give it a try. And from that point on, I fell in love with it. I love working with couples. I enjoy the interaction and true coaching mannerism and style with them. Um, when I think of uh, working with couples in coaching manner, it's really like a group, right? You would consider is a group. Two people are there. They just happen to be in that relationship. So it becomes really sticking on the coach model that we teach in our classes, uh, sticking on that side of that fence. What do they want to get from our sessions? What do they want to take away from our sessions? What's the work in the middle as well as uh, between sessions? So that's, that's the um, big piece of it. The part that needs usually the best assistance while working with a couple is they have already what I would call tainted ears on how they hear each other, built on some resentments and things like that. <clears throat> so I get to be that neutral party that hears things differently. And, you know, like we do in class, we go through reflection on what we're hearing. And in that reflection, when I hear what the one person is saying, reflecting back, oftentimes it catches the other person, um, partner in the relationship, they go, no, you didn't get that from that, right? So they have a different way of hearing. So it becomes a way to reattune uh, how they listen to one another. So that one, they're hearing each other best. And then two, that now they've got to make some decisions based on what they're hearing and how they want to go through that um, regrowth with one another. Periodically, I found that I needed to refer out, but mostly they were coachable. I was going to ask about that because um, you said there's some. Wait, 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 oh, yeah. um, <laughs> before we continue, also, I want to encourage anybody out there watching, anybody out there who's watching the channel and watching this, please participate in the chat. Please leave comments. We are monitoring them. And we do want to hear from you. So if you are watching, please join in the conversation, ask questions. I'm about to sneeze. <laughs> uh, and that's all. Carry on. <laughs> okay. No, I was going to ask about, because um, you said couples bringing stuff from the past or their past assumptions into session and referring out. What is different about couples coaching compared to, let's say, couples counseling or couples therapy? Because it seems to me, I would this is my assumption, I don't know if this is actually the case, that couples go to couple coaching because there's a... Um, like if there's an incident or an inciting moment where they're like, we got to fix this and work on this, let's go find somebody to help us. And that might be like an area of overlap where therapy or counseling might yeah, kind of get the, the therapist, the counselor, 
you know, whoever they're going to with that licensed um, definitely can do the things I'm doing. They're, they're, I'm not, I'm not doing the license side of things, but they can certainly do everything that I do. Coaching mm -hmm. mannerisms, right? The idea of the, the therapist is when it becomes something where they aren't making choices to work through in the moment. So here and now, it's always still a here and now. It's not really, we, we focus on in the moment, how would, do they want to do it differently? How do they want to address things differently? What does it look like? To go into the past history, sometimes that's necessary and that's not something I would do. So that history side of things, why they are the way they are, how the couple got where they are, is not typically the digging point. They'll share that information, but that's not where I dig. How's it affecting you today? And what do you want it to be doing differently from this? So maybe for new couples coaches, then they need to be aware or maybe even hyper aware of like people going into the area, not going there with them. Like, let's say, for example, you're coaching a couple and one of them says, oh, like, a few years ago, my partner cheated on me. Can we talk about that, please? What would, be, that, what would be your reaction to that? How is that impacting you today? What work have you done? How do you want to proceed with this? What and what ways? And if they keep looping in that section where they haven't done the work, where they haven't gone through, they're still in the trauma of it, then that might be a place where I would refer them out. I had a great person that I referred to, uh, trusted him enormously. Um, feedback I got from the clients when they did come in for their coaching sessions was really good. Really phenomenal. I imagine it might be pretty difficult to, well, because I've never done it before, um, coach two people at once. Is there a particular style that you kind of move as a coach um, towards? Do you coach them individually and they kind of split that session? Or is it a or collective effort? Multiple people, more than two. <laughs> or more than two. Depending uh, on the relationship. A few times. It's just everybody is, you know, they have a tendency to be more polite when they have someone else. Hmm. Um, so they will take turns. There's times that they will over speak one another. Absolutely. And, and, you know, one of the things we'll create is maybe a teachable moment that whoever has this, you know, like the old school talking stick, or, um, I read this in a book in, in, in a book where they had a piece of floor. I take the floor and it was literally a piece of floor and whoever had the floor like tile piece or something like yeah, that. Yeah. Um, I had, I had these little like foam hearts. So whoever had the heart was the one that had the speaking uh, space. Um, I also had writing material. So anytime that someone, because oftentimes what occurred is the other person said, you're lying. <laughs> like, hold the phone. Let's check. Right, write down what's not accurate, but let me hear, you know, so it's it is keeping the, keeping the um, boundaries within the session, but sometimes letting those boundaries slide a little bit in the sense of, I really want to see a dynamic of who they are and how they show up for one another. And that can create an interesting place for us to have a communication about too. So it just depends. I trust my instinct with the process. I have a question that slipped my mind. Okay. <laughs> okay. Here it is. Um, in this space of, of goal setting, because the intent of most coaching sessions is to kind of collaborate on a goal with, you know, your client, is that still something that you're mm -hmm. working towards as a, a couples coach? Is that something you want to kind of manifest before the end of the session? Absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. We have that conversation. Sometimes they're not clear on how they want to, um, uh, what they want to get out of the session. Sometimes they come in where they want to be right and the other one's wrong. I had this little cartoon that I would draw. I had a whiteboard and this little cartoon kind of thing I would draw and I would draw a six. So one person could see the six and it would be a nine and the other person would see the six and it would be a six. Who's right and who's wrong. 
So that little teachable moment right. allowed them to think differently and go, well, there is no wrong in that. They're, we're both right. So if we take that and apply that skill to what you're sharing with me, how does that help with the information you're sharing and what the other person is saying? So that became a nice little teachable moment. Mm -hmm. uh I've got a question as well. We talked last week about niching as a coach, um, getting more specific with how you market yourself, advertise your services, who your clientele are, and relationship coaching, that kind of spans a wide gambit. I'm wondering, like, is there a specific area of relationship coaching that you market yourself in? Because I can imagine there's divorcee coaches, there's yeah. parent coaches, there's... If, you know, really for this frustrated couple, the couple that felt like they were just going to, they were going to go and either get work or they were going to be done. Mm -hmm. And I would even say if I focused in on how even some of the vocabulary was mm -hmm. listed and how I advertise, I would say if I think of avatar, right? Cause that's what we mm -hmm. talked about in class. I think of avatar. I think of a 35 year old female, that doesn't mean that that was the only person <laughs> obviously that came in. I had definitely age range fully present in that. But with the advertising I had, which was done through Google, I'm not advertising anymore, but through Google, that's where I put that information out there. And that's who I would attract I, I in my mind who I was talking to. But I would have the partners either side of that fence call and, and come in and schedule those appointments. Oh, and then the other question Jerome asked, do I see one at a time, both of them? And it could vary. It definitely could vary. Usually not that first session. Usually that first session was or is with both of them. Most sessions are. If they had more trouble over speaking one another that's where that time <laughs> apart different sessions could play out the thing when i was in session with them it's there's no secrets in that session so everything that was shared between it's still as if we're in a couple's experience not just one-on-one -on -one. i would refer out if they needed further work in that individual um, kind of thing take Take a quick moment to say hi to Sheila. Hi, Sheila, and hi, April. And uh, Daryl, I, I noticed you touched on that. He has a question. How do you pull um, How do you pull a person in the conversation that is not saying much and or the other person is sharing more? I think what he's saying in this is, is what if you have one, you know, you maybe you've got some stonewalling or some silent treatment going on, and we have one person that is, is speaking and sharing and probably doing a lot of the blaming, and the other person's just stoic and silent. You How look at them in the eye and you say, why aren't you talking? <laughs> why are you so quiet? You're so quiet. You got to start speaking now. No, the, the idea is trust has to be built. And the trust in the session, um, once that person feels like they can speak and not um, be penalized, I guess is the word, <laughs> from their partner, that trust builds. The other side of it is once that partner recognizes that, that I'm not there to take sides, I'm not to go, yes, you're right and you're wrong. Once they recognize that, that there's a space for them to share what's happening, that usually changes. So when they're not saying much, one person may not be a talker in general. So they may be saying a lot in the few words that they're saying. I'm watching body language, I'm watching interaction, I'm watching how the other person is reacting to what's being, so I have, I have a lot of um, things that I'm doing to make sure I'm getting the best sense of what's being said as well. What if you can just outright tell one of them is lying? <laughs> I could, I could. I could. You know, and you can't go, <laughs> but the challenge is I'm curious. You've shared this information, blah, 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 blah. I'm curious how this fits in, right? So there's the challenging fits 
there are times that it's appropriate to do that and there's times that it, it's not ready to go there just yet so you there's a lot of dancing so that I, one does with couples i imagine that there is uh times to um, i've got a couple idea or thing situations running through my head um a couple? where where you have maybe one partner that wants to be there and one that doesn't and that's mm -hmm. kind of tough especially in a coaching realm right because with the coaching space you know, everybody's supposed to be on board and involved and it, it, the information's coming from the client. How do you maneuver in a space where you've got one that wants the, the coaching and one that doesn't? Well, we might have to delve into what the one who doesn't, what their intention is, what they want to, how do they have the understanding that the relationship will improve and what ways and usually they come to the conclusion that they've already been trying things and it hasn't worked. I still go back to it's the, the side of them feeling like you mentioned earlier, shut down. And they part of it that an outside source may not understand what it is that they have in their dynamic. So it, it got every relationship's a little bit different. I, I, as I'm speaking here, I could go, okay, that's one nuance, but then there's a completely different side. So there's, there's all kinds of different ways couples interact and place judgment on one another and the expectations they have for the session. What, um, what as as a couples coach i'm sure you've seen a lot of couples come in and out and anthony i saw you um uh i'm gonna um, make a dumb simpsons reference don't <laughs> okay uh, so i'm sure i'm sure that you've seen a lot of different kinds what is the key <laughs> like what can you is there a defining difference between the ones that that make it and the ones that don't i, I can tell you hands down everyone that did the work outside of our they went home and they did research and they, you know, did whatever homework they said they were going to do. Those typically did very well, very well. The ones that just came in and used our hour or hour and a half, depending on what they were signed up for. And that was the only time they did the work. They felt good when they left the session, but that's the only time that they did the work, they didn't really do it at home. So it became sometimes coaching around the work that they do at home as well, so that they are continuing that growth. But anyone that did the work, the, that impact made a difference. How do you coach around the work they do at home? So we just find out, you know, sometimes something simple or, or, Maybe it sounds simple, but because of where they were in the relationship, that maybe date night, maybe date night, holding hands, you know, getting back to uh, dating one another, that might be the homework. Or they might decide that they wanted to write each other letters, or they decided to do research. One of the, the books that I would have laying around that they could pick up if they wanted was Boundaries. Boundaries was a great book to help them understand how they wanted to, what their intention was. You know, sometimes people don't, know, they, they think that the other person ought to know this by now. And so communications, you have to share what that intention is, what do you hope to get from, from your partner in that moment? You know, I just want to make something up. You know they're having a discussion you come home i just want to i just want to share with my partner and now they're telling me all these things i should and shouldn't be doing the intention here is i just want to share with you i'm letting you know what my needs are i just want you to hear i just want my best friend uh, to share this with and i don't need any fixing in this moment because i've got some things to think about so Putting that little caveat in there helps sometimes couples recognize that their partner just wants to share with them. And as that partner who is on the hearing side, that's all their job is. They don't have to do anything else, just hear what's being said. But even that simple act can sometimes take over uh, and, and not be present 
and that loss of communication. It's really going back to setting those boundaries and how we want to communicate with one another, what that intention is. Uh, we have a question. Lisa, what is the best strategy in coaching, in coaching couples with intimacy issues? So couples who, who apparently aren't, aren't, aren't have, doing so well in the bedroom. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's a, it can go either way, whether that needs to go to therapy or not. There's a lot of times when they share that piece on who they used to be, what pieces are they willing to reintroduce to that couple? Some will say, you know, eat just handhold. We can, all I want to do right now is handholding, even though the other partner wants more than the handholding. What is the couple willing to do? What are they willing to honor? We talk in those um, directions on what their, their boundaries are. What is your boundary around this? What is your deal breaker? So we just have that conversation on where and what, you know, I've got this chat open in my face. Hold on one second. Um, Get ready but, for you. Yeah, what, you know, what is it best that's going to suit you in this moment? Those are the kinds of conversations we have. And as well, I think we might have talked about this last year about like sort of um, different types. I think it was like, it, whatever our title was, it was insane. It was something like crazy coaching is or crazy <laughs> coaching niches or whatever. There's, you know, sex positive coaches out there who work with that specific issue and really only that issue too. The other relationship is separate. Yeah. separate and they only focus on the issue. And that's a good market to focus, focus yourself in because it's such a prevalent problem. Uh, intimacy issues in long-term relationships and in marriages as well. Um, so that might be one area where you want to focus your coaching in. Um, I was going to ask earlier because uh, I've never been to couples therapy or couples coaching. It's just, who knows? People don't like me enough to date me long enough to, to get to that. <laughs> point. But, um, I'm just really great at relationships. That's what Yeah, I'm doing. really great at that stuff. Um, but from what I've seen, like you always see stuff on, I immediately thought of The Sopranos for one. Uh, you thought of Tony, what? The Sopranos, Tony oh, Sopranos. Oh, okay, I thought you said that. <laughs> What's his wife's name, Brooke? Uh, oh, no, no Cam Camilla, Camilla. 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 Uh, Camilla. Her and Tony, <laughs> and we got the one person, uh, the wife in this case, who feels like she's being attacked. He's like, oh, you're going to blame everything on me. And then I thought of the Simpsons episode where Homer and Marge or Marge gets a therapist and Homer doesn't want to go because he's like, oh, you're going to play, you're going to blame everything on me. <laughs> so I'm wondering, Lisa, do you often experience that dynamic where one person feels like, oh, like they feel like they're the problem, but they're going to be attacked for it? There's been times that, uh, I'm not sure how I want to answer what you're asking. So I'm going down this pike and let's see if it answers what you, you have asked. There's sometimes a couple will come in and then what we didn't establish was a clear boundary about when they go home. And, mm -hmm. and um, that becomes an important piece of it as well. For example, if we did not set their boundary, what they wanted their boundary for when they left our session to be, Sometimes what happens. Wait, 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 explain, explain. Hold on. Yeah. I, before you move forward, and what can you give an example of what a that a boundary like that would look like? What what that means exactly? Yeah, setting that boundary for when they go home. Yeah, I'm working that way. <laughs> yeah. So when when we didn't set it, what it means if we do set it is when we leave when you leave the session, what is the what are things to be prepared for when you walk out that door, when you're home, when you're thinking about, when you're thinking about things. So those that did not set it, when they left the session, they went home. I can't believe you said that. Why would you say that? She doesn't know us. She's going to judge all these things. So there's that conversation that sometimes happens outside when they've left that, that conversation in our session needs to be set up so that when you leave, how do you make sure it's a safe space? How do you make sure 
that when you've shared something here, it's not something where you guys will be upset with each other about you what that? you've shared. Huh? How do, you, how do you do that? You just ask, you just say, what, what is this, what will be safe for when you leave here? What, if you leave here and somebody has said something that you weren't expecting, how, how is it helpful to create that safe space for when you're home for that conversation? You know, it happened all kinds of different ways, but that's kind of the idea. Um, oh, go Michelle, ahead, Andrew. I was going to just refer to Michelle Yang. She had a question. Lisa, how do you determine if and when referring out? out for therapy. We have a DSM for reference for individual coaching parameters. So I'm just curious, how do you know when it's beyond a coaching capacity? So the way that I know is if they're doing more of what seems like history conversation, where they're unable to get over what they have gone through versus working on how they want to make those adjustments today. Um, and it's beyond them just sharing what their story is. It is that, that they're still, I, I would say, living in that experience. So if there's, if it, I mean, I imagine um, in, in a case of like infidelity, in a case mm -hmm. of, um, but there's, there's a lot of emotion and feeling there. Mm -hmm. um, you're, you're, coaching in a space where they've sort of, I guess, moved through the emotional part of it and they're, they're looking to move forward or uh, can they still be dealing with the trauma of it? Yeah. Yeah. So, so the idea when there had to been infidelity, it's their work towards moving forward. Typically, again, I have books thrown around my office. I was the in-person coach. And so I would who, <laughs> sneaky, <laughs> throw books when I knew they were coming in. I knew who was coming in and what they were coming in for. I would kind of just lay books out so that they could see it. <laughs> I was going to ask about that earlier too, because it seems, I think earlier in a few lives ago, it might've been a long time. I asked about, yeah, what if you have like a really good coaching tool or specific yeah, um, tool to use? And do I just say it? And you guys were like, no, no, no. Can't just like say it, but you can just leave books around all over the place. Um, and if they ask about it, then, oh, that, I must have left it there on accident. Oh, yes. I was talking to someone else about this book. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I didn't put it away, which is always true. It's never untrue. But yes. Um, so I would do that. And it really just comes down to staying into the coach model is what do they want to get from today? So what, what's brought you in? What do you want to talk about in today's session? Based on that information, what do you hope the outcome is for the end of the session? Or what do you wish to be that success marker for that? What, are some, that what are some examples of like goals couples come in with? I want a divorce. <laughs> I imagine it's not like we want to make, you know, uh, we want to save a hundred thousand dollars by the end of the year. Like imagine those are not the kind of issues like, uh, no, no, but they, they will have come in saying that they want to work on saving money. How do you want to do that? I'm not a financial planner. I'm not licensed professional. So you guys, you know, we work in the way that how they want to work together in that direction. I forgot what your question was. What kind of examples of goals are couples uh, working on together? <laughs> yeah, it just, again, depends. If they don't have money, they, they get intimidated about having to go out on date night. So what, it's an alternative. So the goal could be the alternative of even just having the discussion on what our alternatives are. Uh, a goal could be, well, we could just go walk around our block. We have a nice neighborhood. We could just, you know, if they have kids, take the kids and go for a walk. We can just go for a walk by ourselves. So we're coming up with options. It's finding out what their options are based on what their intention is for the session. What is the, I mean, besides there being two bodies there um, and two personalities, what, what are the primary, I guess, I'll say, I'm going to ask just two ways. What are the, the, the primary, I guess, obstacles 
of, of being a couples coach that vary from being an individual coach? Oh, well, I think one of the big ones is you have to be comfortable with arguments <laughs> and the dissent from one another um, and not get flustered that that's where they, they argue. are. Oh, yeah. I, mean, I know that if we, <laughs> do we just let them, how long do you let that go on for? <laughs> yeah, so it, it depends on... I hate to keep just saying it. it depends. It depends. I'm watching because I'm watching so many different bits and pieces of what they're doing and in their expression. And I would say probably it could go on 10, 15 minutes. Maybe it depends. Sometimes two minutes. So depending on what they're, uh, sometimes they're flexing into the new behaviors that they have set up for themselves. So that dynamic of trying to practice those tools sometimes goes a little longer the actual argument where they're not they're just kind of, I'm 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 usually taking some notes and the notes I'm taking are about uh, vocabulary perhaps about word I mean choices. do you let them get to the point of throwing things at one another or <laughs> <laughs> there, has one gotta get out <laughs> there has been one time that I call it I had to be the puffer fish I had to stand up put my arms out, be like the puffer fish, bigger than them in the sense, and stop the dynamic going on because they weren't hearing <laughs> me say stop. <laughs> so I got up and, and did that and they just kind of snapped out of it. Thank goodness. Because I, I mean, I can imagine I'm not saying that every couple argues that way, but I could see how once the emotions are rolling, you could probably kind of start to lose uh, track of where you're at and what you're doing very quickly. Um, especially, I mean, if there are hurt feelings there and resentments yeah. for sure. Yeah. Yeah. But luckily it hadn't happened in all the years. Lisa's sitting with popcorn. <laughs> you know, it's kind of funny. I watch movies I watch. If there's any, you know, war movies and I don't like those kind of things, but with the couple's dynamic, it doesn't affect me. It doesn't impact like, me in that way. Give me a fighting couple. I mean, <laughs> no, I, I kind of learned from John Gottman. Uh, I mean, learn loosely. It was like, you know, I took some of his classes and one of the things that they did is they recorded their couples and watched that dynamic and helped talk it through um what they did and didn't do as um another therapy we're not doing therapy but that kind of gave a great example does couples coaching help couples <laughs> <laughs> i would hope so does couples coaching help couples to do what stay together break apart <laughs> i don't know <laughs> it's going to depend sometimes it is that they find that they're best served to not be together. Sometimes that's the direction we go. Have then you, you then you become an individual person therapist? Once that happens. <laughs> individual coach sometimes. sometimes. <laughs> go ahead, Anthony. Sorry for interrupting. <laughs> I was gonna say, have you coached a couple whose goal it was from the beginning to say, hey, we're trying to break up or go through a divorce and we're having a hard time separating from each other. Can you help us? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's another yeah. niche you guys can be at the divorce yeah. coach. They, or the they, breaking up coach. What they wanted to do, usually that, that couple had kids and mm. they wanted to do it. And by, 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 there's not many of these couples. I, I applaud them who want to do it uh, and be, kind and considerate of one another even though they're still mad at each other and they recognize that their relationship isn't working the idea of helping them find their boundaries in the breakup that's absolutely part of it you could go you could probably go to an attorney you could probably go to different aspects to share what you do and help couples that way so that they're sending you a referrals. If you want that, to do the couples that you're trying to help and don't work out, you can refer them to the attorney. To exactly. 
<laughs> so when I was in Orange County, California, not there anymore, but when I was there, and this was a few years ago that I read this statistic and I'm like, really? I can kind of believe it. It was 75% of all married couples go through divorce. And I was like, holy Toledo. Okay, that's not just first marriages. It was multiple marriages as well. But like, wow, that is very high. Um, it's actually, I think that the second marriage is actually the, the statistics is greatly reduced. Actually, the second marriages tend to stay together longer. I heard the opposite. I heard really? the opposite. I've heard the really opposite where if you divorce once, you're more likely to get divorced a second and third time. Um, the rates again, I don't, I don't have studies or numbers to throw out there, but right I, now. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not even yes. And at this point, I'm just saying, um, well, no. I, know for, I know for a fact that statistically um, uh, millennials are doing much better in marriage. And I also know that um, uh, the, um, um, uh, same-sex LGBTQ uh, doing much better in marriage. Than, I know. Than- I'm so I'm so excited about those numbers being um, increasing and staying together and longer. But is together longer? Are they in a healthy relationship or are they staying together longer because it's so hard to break apart and separate things and expensive? And so there's a conundrum there as well. But I'm hoping that they're together longer because their relationship so is sixty percent of second marriages, second marriages break up. Seventy three percent of third marriages break up, Whoa. and seventy five percent of of first marriages break up. So yeah. second marriage is a little bit of more of a sweet spot. It goes down and no. it, oh. <laughs> uh, Jerome, I felt like we were stepping all over you. You're going to say something earlier. Yeah, no, I was first, I think we should address April, uh, because she did go ahead and leave a comment for us. She asked, Lisa, how do you coach a couple when one has such guilt from a situation that happened and the other partner is so hurt by it? And I think we kind of touched on this a bit yeah. earlier. It's, just, it's all going to take time. It's all everybody having their voice. It's not going to happen instantaneously. It's everyone finding their um, truth in that moment how they want to proceed and if it stays there it's repetitive that might be the place that that referral becomes important as well also want to mention that relationship coaching um somebody who's answered the phones at clci and also somebody who's had some clients uh and when you look on like thumbtack and bark and things like that i will say that relationships and relationship coaching and help in that space People are looking for that everywhere. <laughs> like, everybody wants help with their relationships. Um, what do you attribute that to? Why do you think that there's so much of a need for help with relationships and people looking for that? Nobody's taught us how to have a healthy relationship. Nobody's taught us, for the most part, how to have boundaries and how to have a boundary without blaming and shaming the other that other person when they when they have tripped up on a boundary you've set. How do you behave then? If you start pointing fingers at the other person, that's where that relationship can be mis, uh, going down that misstep. The idea is if somebody trips up on my boundary, I've shared my boundary, here's what it is. How do we learn and grow through that? Those are the steps because it's never, never is a forever word. Often not uh, something that when you say this is my boundary and it hasn't been your boundary that the partner your partner is going to understand really what that means so there's some growing pains in that place where you're setting that boundary and what are that what are the um, patients what patients can we involve with the process of our learning growing and changing and not be so upset with one another that that change becomes a punishment versus a learning and a growing experience. I have a question about, um, so not necessarily referring out, um, but maybe something similar. So when a couple comes in and has there, is there ever a scenario where they just, it's not working? for the both of them right there in that moment. Is there ever a scenario where you say, hey, 
I'm willing to sit with you individually and I'm willing to sit with you individually. Um, we'll do some work uh, individually and then potentially maybe move back into that couple's uh, space. So it's not one that I um, prescribe sitting with me individually. You know, we'll have that conversation. We'll ask them, you know, even that scaling question from one to 10, how sure are you that this is the direction you want to go? Would what would help you and assist you to make a decision on what it is you want to do? What kind of support do you need? And so that might be where that conversation could come in where they sit individually. And, and usually if I'm going to sit with one as the couple are working together, working, we're all working together. I'll sit with the other one because equal time is I think equally important so that, the one person doesn't feel like the other person is getting more time and then they're going to get sided with. <laughs> I'm just reading, I went off on a, a tangent here and I'm reading uh, statistics now that are, um, I mean, they're just kind of silly, but um, uh, it's one of some of my favorite up here are, are like, um, we don't want the dating wins. We'll see. It's qualities of a, that women or that make men or women find men attractive, <laughs> attractive parts of men, attractive parts of women. <laughs> like, and I'm like, oh my goodness, what an interesting way to take statistics. Um, <laughs> Ten of the sexiest jobs for men. <laughs> well, no more coaching and project directing. <laughs> no copywriting. No, not there. <laughs> <Maggie>. <laughs> I think the highest one is women are attracted to men in medical, dental, and veterinary fields. <laughs> is what it says. Dental. So, I know and that's another field. I know we're we're doing we're, we're doing relationship stuff, but that's another field. The veterinarians. I went to take my cat into a vet, and he was. And you coached it. You, you, you take your cat to a cat coach. I got my little hug at the end, and and he was sharing with me how. There's many veterinarians that are so, they don't have any support. So I don't forget them too. That the veterinarians need coaches too? Doctors. Do. <laughs> I don't get them mixed up with a veterans coach though. Those are different occupations. No, I meant veterinarian, animal doctors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I just think I'd, I'd be, it'd be funny, but also sad if a veteran walked as like, I heard you treat or coach veterans. Like, <laughs> nope. Veterinarians, only animal guys. Um, Fortunately, 30% of uh, what people find attractive is personality. So that's tracking higher than, than looks, which is nice. That's good. <laughs> that's good. Um, I told you, lost in this. 48% uh, of breakups in online relationships happen by email. Well, is that even a relationship? Is that not online? crazy? <laughs> I'm, text. I'm breaking up with you over text. How, how I can't does believe that, that. From that? I just don't even know. Yeah, I literally can't that, believe that. That could be a, a coaching niche is coaching long term or long distance relationships or online relationships um i was about to say something really stupid right now never mind <laughs> i'm just gonna show my age that's all 48 uh, percent of singles say that they have googled someone before a first date <laughs> i have done that is that I don't fair think that's wrong i don't think that's wrong i think with yeah. the, the cool. people that are out there that i think it's an important thing to know as much as you can know before you go out. I mean, you hope they're not a serial murderer. They say that 40 million number or 40 million people is the number of Americans that use online dating services. Wow. Um, I, I thought that would be higher too. And yeah. 71% of people believe in love at first sight. Do you guys, I don't oh, believe in love at first sight. I think that's madness. <laughs> I think there's attraction at first sight, yes. Yes. But not love yes. at first sight. No, no way. Love, what, is, what is love after all? What, what is love? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't love a bit of a decision? So I guess you could potentially fall in I love want, at first sight. I have what, is what is love? What is love in your mind? What is love? Um yeah. how would you define it? Love to me is a collaboration um, to really share each other's lifestyles and enjoy the best parts of each other and enhance the best parts of each other. 
Um, it's mutual a mutual release a, of oxytocin. Yeah, and I think I think above everything, <laughs> above everything it is a choice. Um, you have to choose to want to be in a relationship, and you have to choose to want to be in love. I think it doesn't just passively happen. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel like a lot of people get that confused. Yeah, I want to ask Lisa what the most important part of of um, basically being in a relationship or, or keeping a relationship together, making a relationship happen. Um, I asked, you know, myriad of things. Was it trust? Was it commitment? Was it was it Ooh. respect? Was it what was it? And what was your answer, Lisa? <sighs> I think there's several things, but I think patience is a big piece. You told me commitment. <laughs> I would say the yes commitment is because the, I mean that's part of the patience thing is to not jump to conclusions to not have an easy out well, unless that was the, it needs to be an out the, the explanation I mean was that you can fall in love over and over again you can you can learn to change your behaviors you can learn to respect one another you can learn to be honest you can learn to do all these things but you can't do so if you're not committed to one another and, and committed to coming back to making it work with one another yeah. and so the moment that's, that that's patience right <laughs> patience committed to coming back together to turn towards one another when you go i'm gonna say coconuts because i we, that is what we do. We argue. We, we might go down the wrong highway and make assumptions about and hear things all wrong. But the idea is to have patience with who you yourself, with the person you're working with, come back, have a conversation, which is that commitment piece that you're talking about, Brooke. And, and uh, I mean, have the conversation when you're not so <laughs> heightened with that adrenaline rush. Well, you definitely pay for it all. <laughs> yeah patience in that don't go run out and, and and you know just breathe and and don't make any uh drastic decisions <laughs> uh, no, no, on a whim that you'll regret later <laughs> no, no decisions in that moment no decisions really you don't want to make any decisions in them it's later i can think of one time shh, don't tell my husband he might be listening <laughs> shh, one time <laughs> way back when we've been married yeah, really. <laughs> 34 years now i think we were in year seven yeah, oh the seven year itch seven year itch seven we got into this really stupid i mean the most stupid fight you could even think of it was so stupid i'm don't, like don't listen <laughs> yeah don't <laughs> listen. i'm done and he's done we're done and then after we all cooled off all the two of us cooled off had a conversation and like it start, we start laughing because it was the stupidest fight ever <laughs> that's an important rule though is don't throw down the gauntlet of of we're done we're breaking up it's over we're getting a divorce i'm out you can't go there first that can be like your go-to like that has to be like last resort like <laughs> you don't go there unless you mean it <laughs> and, and the cool thing is we didn't use that really before right seven years in and we're using it in that moment, we thought that was a truth statement. Good. We hadn't used it, <laughs> but it was not a truth statement. It was a really angry rage, maybe even rage, I would say, because that adrenaline, that cortisol was really kicked up, notched up really strongly. And that when the chemistry of our body got back to normal, <laughs> it's like, oh, what are we doing? <laughs> what are we thinking? <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if like you guys were in a very tight and enclosed place or something where you could not get away from one another, you know, I'm like, um, uh, well, but, we had yeah. a little house back then, so we had a little tiny house, so maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we only have aspect. a few minutes left, what? I was just going to say that's an important aspect of making sure you're taking time for yourself to, uh, to cultivate that relationship, because if you lose sight of who you are, then I mean, things can get messy. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I used to firmly believe in, in, in sort of s sitting down and, and, and I, I, but this is crazy Brooke. This is old crazy Brooke. I like, 
<laughs> who I wanted everything to be spelled out, like and like no room for for error or or deviation. Like oh, this is, um, but that's not real reality. That's not real life. That's not. <laughs> um, uh, it's so so audio digital right there. Um, uh, what is your greatest piece of advice? for, which I know coaches don't give advice, but we'll say for on two levels, for somebody who wants to be a couples coach and for somebody, for, for the couples out there or those who want to be in a couple. <laughs> so the couples coach. So I have talked to many, even just therapists who want nothing to do with couples. It is a, it's a different dynamic. So as a couples coach, it's just staying in your peace, being able to be in peace, not taking home what the couples are going through, you worrying about, did you do your best? I'm always going to learn more. Is there something I could do differently? But I always do my best. I'm doing my best in this moment. The next moment, I might be able to do better based on what I learned. So continue learning, continue growing and, and, and adapting to each of the couple's who are different when they come to you. I would say that to the couple's coach. As far as a couple, be willing to do the work. Do the work. Honestly, there's couples that pretended to do the work. I finally got the message um, and with this one couple that I'm thinking of. This couple, you know, they went out, said they were going to do this. One partner was ready to do the work. And this was actually a couple different couples, not just one. The other person said they weren't. And then they, like, I felt like I was jumping through hoops. I felt like I was like, how can I best help this couple? What? And then all of a sudden it dawned on me that I'm working too hard. It's them that need to work. And I said, I think I'm missing a message. Tell me what I'm missing. And they will share in that moment that they're done. And that's where then we got down to real coaching, I mean, not real coaching, but real work, because then they had to determine what they, what that meant. So it's not about you working as a coach harder than that client. Same thing we say in class, don't work harder than your client. Pay attention if you are. That means you're missing something. Ask the questions. Couples, just do the work. That's going to help you promote and, and be in growth of that relationship. Be willing to have a conversation after the fight. <laughs> be willing to have hard conversations, keep them kind and honest. That's what I would say. That's good advice. <laughs> <laughs> think that just about wraps up um, our little live on what is a relationship coach. So coaches, if you're thinking about your niche and where you want to go in relationship coaching and all the different areas of it, uh, this is a good area to get into as well. And if you're in a relationship, go get a relationship coach. Now find one immediately as fast as possible. That's it. That's all I got to say. Absolutely. Goodbye everyone. <laughs> Okay, so for next week, we come to you with Relationship Killers. I'm excited for that one. Um, we did it last year, so we're going to revisit it. And uh, we yeah, we'll be visiting more. all the top reasons that, that relationships fail, what all the things that go wrong, all the, um, and of course, of course, of course, what we can do to help them. Um, and then the following week, our last week of Relationship Month, we're going to be sort of delving into a little bit, we touched on it today. Um, how to coach around uh, the harder things that happen in relationships, which is the traumas and how do you recover and like what tools can be used? What are actual tools that can be given and used in those cases for folks? Um, and this, this today was about the couple, the coach, the next two weeks will be for the couples more so. So, <laughs> um, and I think that I mean, maybe we'll even do for those who uh, maybe, maybe we'll do some dating for folks who are single, too, that are out there. I feel like we're neglecting them a little bit. So <laughs> um, and for those of you watching, if you enjoyed it, make sure you like, share, comment, all that good stuff. And make sure you check out Certified Life Coach Institute. We uh, certify coaches in three days.
Anything else, guys? Goodbye, yeah. everyone. Bye. Happy Valentine's Day. See you yes. <laughs> Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to today's episode. Once again, this is brought to you by Certified Life Coach Institute. We're an ICF accredited school who certifies our life coaches in three-day online intensive courses. In addition to other podcast episodes, feel free to check us out every Tuesday at 4 o'clock p.m. Pacific Standard Time on YouTube or Facebook for our CLCI Lives, where we get together and discuss various topics that are centered around sharpening your skills so you can become a better certified life coach. For more information, feel free to visit us at certifiedlifecoachinstitute.com. Until next time, be well.